read uh, Ezra chapter 3, in case you didn't have a chance to read it this week. Uh, we're going to read the whole of it. It's just 13 verses. Um, and uh, we'll go from there, okay? So verse 1, starting in Ezra 3, the word of the Lord in Ezra. In early autumn, when the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled in Jerusalem with a unified purpose. Then Jeshua, son of Jehoshadak, joined his fellow priests and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, with his family in rebuilding the altar of the God of Israel. They wanted to sacrifice burnt offerings on it, as instructed in the law of Moses, the man of God. Even though the people were afraid of the local residents, they rebuilt the altar at its old site. Then they began to sacrifice burnt offerings on the altar to the Lord each morning and evening. They celebrated the festival of shelters as prescribed in the law, sacrificing the number of burnt offerings specified for each day of the festival. They also offered the regular burnt offerings and the offerings required for the new moon celebrations and the annual festivals as prescribed by the Lord. The people also gave voluntary offerings to the Lord. Fifteen days before the festival of shelters began, the priests had begun to sacrifice burnt offerings to the Lord. This was even before they had started to lay the foundation of the Lord's temple. Then the people hired masons and carpenters and bought cedar logs for the people of Tyre and Sidon, paying them with food, wine, and olive oil. The logs were brought down from the Lebanon mountains and floated along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea to Joppa, for King Cyrus had given permission for this. Then the construction of the temple of God began in mid-spring, during the second year after they arrived in Jerusalem. The workforce was made up of everyone who had returned from exile, including Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Jeshua, son of Jehoshadak, and his fellow priests, and all the Levites. The Levites, who were 20 years old or older, were put in charge of rebuilding the Lord's temple. The workers at the temple of God were supervised by Jeshua, with his sons and relatives, and Cadmiel and his sons, all descendants of Odebiah. They were helped in this task by the Levites of the family of Hinnadab. When the builders completed the foundation of the Lord's temple, the priests put on their robes and took their places to blow their trumpets. And the Levites, descendants of Asaph, clashed their cymbals to praise the Lord, just as King David had prescribed. With praise and thanks, they sang the song to the Lord. He is so good. His faithful love for Israel endures forever. Then all the people gave a great shout, praising the Lord, because the foundation of the Lord's temple had been laid. But many of the older priests, Levites, and other leaders who had seen the first temple wept aloud when they saw the new temple's foundation. The others, however, were shouting for joy. The joyful shouting and weeping mingled together in a loud noise that could be heard far in the distance. It's a really interesting chapter that we have here, right? This coming back to exile. And the big question that looms, that hangs over them is, what are we going to do? Who are we going to be now? Now, like you, I participated in a lot of group activities in my short years of life on this earth. I played sports like many of you when I was young, right? Was never good enough to go, what was that? You're still young. I'm still young in, to some people. <laughs> not to others, I'm not so young. I played sports probably like most of you did, right? At least for a time. I, uh, I participated in other school activities like choir, right? I was, was in choir, so that was a group activity that I got to do with other people. My favorite group activities, of course, were youth group activities. And it just so happens, it's, it's a happy coincidence, that my old youth minister is sitting on our audience today because Rachel's dad was our youth minister. And we had so much fun on our trips. Now, of course, the trips weren't about having fun. But inevitably, we did have fun on those trips. But I remember those trips in particular being my favorite experiences as a person part of a group. Every summer, our youth group made a trip to Colorado. This was probably my favorite trip of all. Um, and I, I wrote about another one in my Bolson article this morning. I wrote about when we would go to Mexico. So if you're interested in that, you can, you can read about that in my Bolton article. 
And some of you have heard me talk about this before, that we used to go to Colorado and hike every summer. Those trips were obviously very fun because we got to go somewhere different. See, I grew up in Texas. We didn't have mountains around. There was no such thing as Mount whatever where I lived. Um, that just wasn't a thing. So going to Colorado and seeing the Rocky Mountains in particular was really quite spectacular. I mean, I, I absolutely loved going on those trips. And so those trips were incredibly rewarding for so many different reasons. And not just because our group got a chance to summit a mountain every summer, as exciting and exhilarating as that was. I mean, that was really cool, right? It's a sight to behold to stand on top of a mountain. But that trip was also really good to help our youth group bond together in different ways. I mean, you really begin to know and see a person when you both haven't showered for six days straight. And there's something to that. When you're all just smelly together, there's something very unifying about that event. What was amazing was that as the years went on, we got to go after our eighth grade uh, school year, and then all through, you know, being uh, graduating from high school. What was amazing was that each year, even though the group changed, right? New, new youth group members come in as old ones leave. That trip in particular was this very unifying sort of trip. And it did something to us that, that other trips just, just couldn't do. The idea of unity, of being together, of having a common goal and purpose. That's how Ezra chapter 3 begins. So let's turn there as we talk about this idea of an old foundation but a new building. Okay. So we're going to talk about unity in the face of adversity. See, in verse 1, we see this idea. We're told that all the people assembled in Jerusalem with a unified purpose. And though the Israelites who returned have done so at the direction of King Cyrus, I mean, this new king of Persia actually sent them home. Right? That was unheard of back then. And though many of them believed that they had a mandate by God to rebuild the temple, they didn't complete it for years upon years upon years. And they definitely would never have done so if they didn't learn to stand together. They faced a lot of hardships upon returning to Jerusalem. Many of the people who returned, they were just done with Yahweh. They were done with this God who sent them into exile. I mean, God sent them into exile. Is that really a God you want to serve anymore? A God that would punish you so much that he would kick you out of your promised land. So many of the Israelites were just done with God. They, they faced hardships from other people who weren't Israelites, who came and settled in the land after they had been taken into exile. And you can read a little bit more about that in chapter 4, if you happen to read chapter 4, which I told you to do last week. It's still in chapter 3, it's just covering chapter 3. They also faced hardships working together. Yeah, they assembled with a unified purpose, but that doesn't mean that they were all pleased with the outcome. Look again at verses 12 and 13 of chapter 3. I, I love these two verses. But many of the older priests, Levites, and other leaders who had seen the first temple, Solomon's temple, wept aloud when they saw the new temple's foundation. The others, however, were shouting for joy. The joyful shouting and weeping mingled together in a loud noise that could be heard in the far distance. And there are a couple of ways that we can think about these two verses. First, that the weeping of the older priests is actually that of joyful sort of weeping, right? You know, there are all sorts of examples of people who literally weep for joy, and we even use that expression, to weep for joy. One example might be a, a person or a family of somebody who has a terminal illness, and they go for a follow-up um, you know, appointment, and all of a sudden, the terminal illness is gone. Right? The disease that they thought was going to take their life is miraculously no longer there. Those sorts of people often weep for joy, right? They're not sad, they're excited and they're happy, and it brings them to tears. The second way of thinking about this could be that the weeping 
is actually true and deep sorrow that the older priests are experiencing. Perhaps, perhaps they already know that no matter what happens, no matter how this new temple turns out, it's never going to compare to the temple that Solomon built. It's going to lack the grandeur, right? It's, going to, it's, it's not going to compare in scale to what they saw before. Now, whatever the case, both the weeping and the shouts here are heard in this moment and are indistinguishable. It's such a beautifully strange sort of event that we have. It's, it's so raw and emotional. It draws you in in a really interesting way. I've said this before, and it bears repeating. Unity is not the same thing as uniformity. Sometimes we think, that gets us in trouble. Sometimes we think that unless we all believe or think exactly the same thing, in exactly the same way, that there must be some sort of disunity or disharmony between us. We do this to ourselves all the time. And it's just not true. And this moment is a great example of this. The people were unified in their endeavor, right? They wanted to see the temple of the Lord rebuilt. It's very clear in verses 12 and 13. They didn't have the same vision for what that was going to look like. It's very clear that the older priests and the younger priests weren't a hundred percent unified in exactly what the new temple would look like. And yet they're unified in their purpose. And so we have to ask the question, anytime that we're part of a group, as we are as a church, what does it mean to be unified? Does it mean that we have to think exactly the same way on every single topic known to man? Well, if it does, I dare say none of us would be here this morning. Because I'll just guarantee you, there are things that you disagree with me about. Welcome to church. That's why we're here. To be unified, not, not to somehow uh, have this groupthink mentality where everything we, we think just coalesces into one. We have a unified purpose to follow God. We have a unified purpose to see other people follow God. And if that, may, if, if that remains our focus, the extraneous things kind of fall away, right? We kind of quit fighting about those sort of things. We see that here in Ezra chapter 3. Then there's this idea that the new temple points to the future. I mean, again, the question kind of hanging over the people is, what does the new temple mean? What does it mean for them? And then ultimately, what does it mean for us now? Well, for the people then, it clearly meant that once more, they could worship God the way that they were supposed to. Right? And we see in, in this chapter all these different sorts of worship things that they're beginning to do again. Right? Having these feasts, offering the sacrifices now that the altar has been rebuilt. There's a sense in which they're getting their identity back. Identity becomes a really important thing to all people, and in particular, in particular to the Israelites. Because the temple, once again, means that sick people have a place to go to be healed, to have their diseases prayed over by the properly prescribed priest. The new temple means that, once again, the people have a place to go to be in the presence of God, because that's where God it's called his house. The word for temple in Hebrew is just the word house. It's God's house. And so this is a monumental sort of thing for the Israelites to begin to rebuild this. So as we think about identity, think about the ways that we identify as Americans. What sort of things give us our identity? Now, while we, may, while we may not place as much emphasis on, you know, one particular building in America as, as, you know, having our identity, there's no doubt that as a nation, it would cripple us. It would cripple our resolve and our sense of identity if all of a sudden the U.S. Capitol building and the White House were destroyed. 
right? If some country came in and destroyed those two buildings, that would rock our world. I mean, as a country, we we identify around those two buildings. They, they house the most powerful people in our country. They mean so much to us. Now take that feeling that you have by thinking about that and multiply it exponentially. Because the building wasn't, the, the, the temple wasn't just a building for politics in ancient Israel. It was where God was. It was where God was. And ever since its destruction, the nation of Israel wasn't really the nation of Israel. So what does it mean for us today? Obviously, we don't identify with the temple, uh, not least because it was torn down again in 87, right, uh, by the Romans. But it's because it's not our book, right? We, we don't identify it, uh, identify with it for a lot of reasons. But the temple becomes, for us, a way to point to Jesus. Now, here's where I want to be careful and not make the mistake of saying that everything in the Old Testament is only good because it points to Jesus, right? The Old Testament is good on its own, but it does also tell us about this person to come. In fact, we talked about that last week in Isaiah 40, where he declared that your God is coming. We believe that to have happened in the person of Jesus. And he fulfills the promises that God made to the world. I think the rebuilding of the temple points to that truth as well. Because once Jesus came, once he showed up, sick people didn't have to go to the temple anymore. They got to go to him. They got to touch him and be touched by him to be healed. Once Jesus came, a person didn't have to go to the temple to be in God's presence. God's presence was literally walking and talking with them everywhere that they were. The presence of God came to them in the form of a person. They could see God and be seen by him because of Jesus. In the temple, there were these clearly divided sections. Right? If you're a Gentile, you have to stay outside in this area. If you're a woman, you have to stay just inside of that area. If you're a man, you can go in a little bit further. And then if you're a priest, you can go in further. And then if you're the high priest once a year, you get to go into the really special place where God really is. And with Jesus, everybody can draw in. Every single person can draw near to God. So the temple points to Jesus, and the rebuilding of this temple points to God coming in Jesus. And of course, Jesus even declared about himself that he is the temple. What did he tell the people? Tear this temple down, and in what? Three days, it will be rebuilt. He was talking about himself. So the temple of God, this rebuilding of the temple, I think has meaning for us as well. So it's time to rebuild. And now that the Israelites are going to rebuild, what needs to happen? How should they proceed with all of this? Now, I'm not a construction worker, okay? I don't do contract work. Uh, in fact, I know very little about any of that. And again, as I wrote in my, uh, in my bulletin this morning, we went to Mexico and did work projects for churches down there. I was just the lackey being told what to do, right? I trusted other people to point me with a hammer and say, go over there, or to go cut rebar at this length, and they need this many pieces. I can do that. I can follow those instructions, but I don't have the vision for, for, for building. But if you're going to rebuild something, what do you have to do first? What do you have to do first? You've got to clear away the old, right? You've got to at least clean out, right? So that you can build on top of a sure foundation. So it takes time. It takes time to go through the materials that you have and say, that brick is still good. I can use that one. This one, though, is crumbling. 
probably shouldn't use that in this new building project. It takes time. It takes skill to carefully lay out a plan of action right, as you think about rebuilding a new building. And that's what we see happening in this chapter. People are designated to complete those important tasks for, for rebuilding the temple so they can get the job done. Again, there's very little I know of building, an actual building. But I do know something about building a spiritual life. I know something about spirituality. And the truth is, I think building a spiritual life is somewhat similar to what a carpenter does, to what a contract worker does. Think about it. When you're young, you're given a foundation to believe in, right? And as you grow and gain more experiences, you build on top of it. And then for a lot of people at some point in their late teens, early 20s, some of that begins to get knocked down, right? For whatever reason, it begins to get knocked down. And the truth is, I kind of think that's okay. I kind of think it's okay to, to knock away certain things because maybe we didn't need those at least not anymore. But then how do you go about rebuilding your spiritual life? You carefully assess what you need to keep and what you don't. Building a spiritual life doesn't happen overnight. We're talking about this on Wednesday nights downstairs in our class. That spiritual development is, it is a process that takes time. And if you try to rush it, you're going to get it wrong. Just like we, we've seen this. People rush on a building project, and what happens inevitably to that building? It begins to crumble, right? Much, much sooner than it should. It begins to fall down. Your spiritual life is the same way. You have to carefully assess, you have to skillfully think about what needs to be put in place to build on that sure and solid foundation. See, your building that's a goal can tell us something about how we need to build our own spiritual lives. So to conclude today, a couple things to think about as we, as we leave. How well do you think that we're doing? I want you to think about this from a standpoint of us as a church. How well do you think we're doing at being unified as the body of Christ, as a local congregation, right? but also as the church at large? How are we doing at being unified? That takes, uh, that's a difficult question. It takes a, a long, introspective look at ourselves to really begin to assess how we're doing at being unified. I think in some ways we're probably doing very well. Perhaps in others, there's definite room for improvement. So how are we doing at being unified as a church? It's an important question for me to, to think about as we leave today. And then the second one is, is your spiritual foundation solid? Do you have a sure foundation? And then what parts may need to be torn down so that you can rebuild and have a stronger thing? I'm not saying sweep the whole thing aside. I'm not saying come in like the Babylonians or Romans and tear down the whole thing. But are there places in your spiritual life that need to be rethought? Are there places that need to be rebuilt? We all need to be doing constant assessment of our own spiritual lives. Because if we've just erected something and left it, hey, I'm done. It's bills. I don't need to do anything else. And I don't think we're doing the proper due diligence to challenge ourselves to continue to grow. To have conversations with brothers or sisters who might challenge you, right? Who say, no, let's, let's rethink this together. Maybe there's a different way to approach this, this topic or this idea. Spiritual formation isn't a one and done sort of thing. It doesn't happen overnight. So are we going to be the kind of people that, that do this sort of spiritual assessment and feel, feel stronger going forward? 
You didn't know there was good news in Ezra 3, did you? You didn't know there was something to learn in Ezra chapter 3. How many of you have actually ever read Ezra 3 before? A couple of people. Yeah, yeah about half of you. Uh, it's not an indictment of those of you who haven't. You just needed to read it. And you didn't know it. It's good news, guys. In God's Word, and even in Ezra chapter 3. As we head into next week, as we begin to think about Christmas time, um, as you begin to, you know, formulate plans with your family and with friends and all these sorts of things that we do around this time of year. I want you to imagine what it would be like if we didn't just get excited about Jesus around this time of year. A little bit of a challenge to you this week. Um, don't let Christmas be the only time think about and get excited about the fact that Jesus came to be with us, right? As we uh, end today, we're going to have a time where you can come forward and ask for prayers, encouragement to uh, just let us know what's going on in your life, and we want to support you and be here for you. So if there's anything that you need from us, uh, let us know about it as we stand and as we sing.